Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the podcast. I'm Josh, and there's Chuck, and Jerry just laughed, so it's just me and Chuck being bad boys going through our stamp collection. Oh, yeah. That's right. The purposefully silent Jerry, by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's her own choice. Yeah. She, she's a real live human being. Jerry's had like. plenty of chances. We've asked her, and she loves being in the background and not being on the show. Just want to make That's that right. clear. She's a wallflower. Mm-hmm. A lazy, semi-useless wallflower. <laughs> That we love like a sister. That's right. And who keeps us in line. And who may or may not even exist. That's right. Let's talk about stamps, baby. So I already said we're, we're talking about stamp collecting. Oh, and by the way, this is stuff you should know. I think that it's not an official episode in, until I say that. What do you think? Uh, that's our watermark. Okay. Yeah, nice reference, Chuck, because mm-hmm. we're going to talk about those later. Wow. You have been doing this for a while, haven't you? <laughs> a couple of years. So, um, we're talking stamp collecting. I don't collect stamps. I never have collected stamps. Um, I've never been friends with somebody who collected stamps. Me neither. As far as I know, no relatives have collected stamps. You ever collect anything? I collected baseball cards. Okay. The huge, you know? Yeah. But it turns out, I would I would posit that stamp collecting is vastly more popular than baseball card collecting, as, as popular as baseball card collecting is. I think if you're talking worldwide, probably so, yeah. For sure. Because, I mean, over in some countries, they don't even care about baseball. Nope. They're like, I don't even know who Freddie Freeman is. <laughs> I like the alliteration, but I don't know who he is. <laughs> oh, they should. He's great. Sure. I, mean, I remember when he was a rookie. Do you have a rookie card? No, I stopped collecting baseball cards when I aged out of the, well, baseball card age. Yeah, sure. But, uh, yeah, it was long before Freddie Freeman. No, I don't have one of his cards. Do you? No, I don't collect baseball cards. I collected banks. I think I've talked about that before. Uh, No. (laughs) I don't know why. It's weird. I think I just had more than one of them and then said, well, this is a start to something. And I collected, like, uh, I mean, technically they were piggy banks, but none of them were pigs. Okay, I got you. So, you know, I think I had like 30 or 40 banks at one point when I was a kid, little banks. I suspected you were talking about banks, banks. Like, you'd walk around and, like, slap your hand on, like, a fifth third and been like, I just collected this bank. No. (laughs) Something like that. No. So, piggy banks that weren't pigs. Yeah, you know, it was like a, just banks, little banks. Yeah, what was the coolest one you had? Uh, I got one from a, like a Napa Auto Parts that was a car battery bank. And that was, <laughs> was kind of cool. cool. <laughs> I remember oh. that stands out in my memory for some reason. I can imagine, but cool, I don't know, is the right <laughs> word for it, but okay. That's the we'll, only we'll one I can really remember. I had a Mickey Mouse bank, but who that, doesn't? That's a good one, too. I had a Spider-Man piggy bank, the, the bust of, you know, oh. 1970s Spider-Man. Wow. And I That's broke it cool. open with a hammer and used all yeah. the money inside to buy candy and two lunches at school <laughs> for a stretch. It was like I was walking around like I was the king of England in the cafeteria. I thought you were going to be like my first pack of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> there was just a few short years before then. Uh, but yeah, stamp collecting. I've never known anyone who's done it, but it is hugely popular. Mm-hmm. And it seems like a really kind of lovely, pleasant thing because as is pointed out here, in this uh, article, who was this? Was this Ed? Yeah, a grabster. Uh, it's like, you know, collecting little pieces of art, little tiny works of art. Exactly. But even more than that, stamps have a very deep, detailed, intricate, arcane history. Yeah. And I mean stamps in general, but also every single individual stamp. And the stamp collecting community really loves to dig into that history and sure. know all about all the different stuff about every single stamp. Um, and so there's a lot of information to absorb while you're collecting, which I think is one of the big draws of collecting anything is the background information to it, too. Definitely, like, look at, you can enjoy a stamp just on its face. It's pretty, mm-hmm. it's neat, it's really well done, usually, or at least the ones that are worth collecting. Serves but a purpose. But the idea, sure, that too. But the idea, and it has, you know, a history 
just from sometimes being old. But mm-hmm. then also the idea that it has a backstory too. Um, it's just about as, as well-rounded a hobby as, as you could find. Agreed. So another term for stamp collecting is called phylately, P-H-I-L-A-T-E-L-Y. It's not the easiest word to spell until you stop and think about it. But it it's derived from the words philo or love of, like philosophy, love of knowledge. But this is love of atelia, and that is exemption from payment. So you would use a stamp to show that whatever you were sending or whatever is exempt from payment. You already paid. So really, phi lately means love of stamps in a really roundabout way. Now, see, I heard it pronounced philately. Oh, really? We'll go with that one then. Okay. Because <laughs> I've just been pronouncing that that way in my head for a very long time. Philately. There you have it. Who is that with you? <laughs> Her name is uh, mispronunciation. Emma, Emma says <laughs> mispronunciation. That was good. Chuck. Yeah, mis- mis- mispronunciation. We're not going to assume anything. You know, one of the things. Very good. One of the things that um, that I've noticed in QAing episodes is how many jokes of yours slide right past me while you're saying them, and I don't catch them until I'm QAing an episode later on. So, so many hats jokes. off for all those jokes that I've missed. <laughs> Uh, if you're going to get into philately or be a philatelist, then uh, you should know that it's not like a get-rich-quick thing. You, you do it mm-hmm. sort of for the love of the hobby itself. And as you go along over the years, you may eventually acquire some stamps that may be worth some money. But it's not the kind of thing where um, just get into it with the the intentions that uh, you should have, which is you're not going to make a ton of money doing this kind of thing. Yeah, get into it for the love of collecting stamps. That's yeah. the way to do it. Yeah, that's kind of eye-opening and surprising, I think, to most of us for, on the outside of the philately world looking in. Because, you know, we hear about these auctions where stamps go for millions of dollars. And sure. Every once in a while, they'll pop up as like a, a MacGuffin in a movie or something like that. Um so the idea that almost all stamps or the wildly vast majority of stamps are really not worth much at all is, is kind of surprising, or it was to me at least. But it also, it just makes me love stamp collectors that much more, you know? Yeah, and I think one thing I really love about stamp collecting, which is sort of toward the end of this research, but I'll go ahead and say it now, is that it seems like the stamp collecting purists only collect stamps that are actually – used to mail things yep. like get out of here with your special edition collector thing that is just printed up for some certain you know to give to a dignitary like they want stamps mm-hmm. like mail in letter stamps that's right and as a matter of fact there's a kind of considered one of the big authorities on stamps the scott catalog they apparently don't even recognize stamps that aren't released by government's for the purposes of mailing postage to the general public. If it if it's not released like that by those authorities, then it doesn't exist as far as that's concerned. Yeah, I mean, it seems like part of the fun is finding these things on an old letter, mm-hmm. like a cool discovery. And uh, I just, I like the idea of it. I'm, I'm probably not going to get into it just because I don't have the time for this kind of thing, but sure. I can certainly appreciate it. And then there's one other aspect of it, too, that I kind of turned up from this, and I'm, I'm sure it's not entirely correct across the board, but it seems like a person's stamp collection is a very personal thing. Mm-hmm. It, it says, like, I'm interested in this. Yeah, so totally. I went to the trouble of finding these things. And in that sense, it almost bears a, a resemblance to that super adorable coin collection that Owen had in Throw Mama from the Train. <laughs> Remember when he pulls out his coin collection and instead of some rare coins, it's like a quarter that he had, he got change for when he was at Coney Island with his yeah. dad when he was 12. It's it's kind of like that, you know. It's, it's a really endearing hobby, I think. Yeah, because it's not like you're like, all right, I'm going to get into stamp collecting and, you know, what are the best stamps to collect for right. You know, the best stamps to collect are the ones that speak to you. So if you get into it for a little while and you're like, boy, the stamps from the Roaring Twenties really are are pretty cool looking to me or stamps with dogs on them. Mm-hmm. Or you could collect many, many kinds of stamps. But a lot of people sort of 
get into stamp collecting and realize I like these kinds of stamps. So that's what my collection is going to reflect. Exactly. That's exactly right. Very cool. So that's stamp collecting, everybody. (laughs) Should we take a break? (laughs) Should we already? Sure. Let's do it, Chuck. Let's throw caution to the wind like every average stamp collector does. Great. Okay, we're back. And um, we should say, Chuck, I think if this seems a little weird, if the tone seems a little weird today, this is one of our um, less than usual Thursday recording sessions. So it's it's always a little like <laughs> more footloose, you know what I mean? Sure. My feet are very loose. <laughs> so we should probably give some terms here uh, if you're interested in getting a stamp collector. If you just want to know a little more about it, there is a lot of arcane jargon and slang in the world of stamp collecting. And one of the reasons why it's been around for almost a couple hundred years now. And over that time, there's just kind of been successive generations who've kind of added and refined and contributed to it, but they all have to know what they're talking about to one another. So they've kind of come up with a bunch of different terms to describe things. Yeah, like in true stuff you should know fashion, this is a broad overview. There are Mm -hmm. entire podcasts dedicated to this kind of thing. Right. Uh, So we're going to go over some of those broad definitions. And the first one we have to talk about is the gum, which is that sticky stuff that uh, killed George Costanza's wife or (laughs) fiancé. Well, hers was from licking envelopes, right? Or was it stamps? Uh, I guess it was envelopes, wasn't it? But the same thing. It's still gum. Exactly. I forgot about that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, because he got the cheap cheap stuff. Yeah, he cheaped out. (laughs) Um, so this is what's used to stick the stamp on. If the stamp has never been used at all, it's like this pristine little thing. It's, it's called full original gum. Mm -hmm. And then it's called new gum. If you have a stamp and you want to add a little, uh, gum to it, to stick it into your collection, which we'll get to as well. Yeah. So the sticky stuff equals gum, right? Pretty simple. Let's get a little more complex, Chuck. Ooh. What's a block? <laughs> a block is a group of stamps that are still connected to their little friends, mm-hmm. but it's got to be at least four, in a, and they can't be four in a row either. It, for my research, it's two and two. It's got to be a square block. Yeah, I saw that they're, as long as they're four, it can be irregular shapes because sometimes blocks of stamps get, added to or messed with or just changed over the decades or the centuries. So I, I've seen that more than that, but in a less regular shape is still considered a block. But what about four in a row and a strip? Does that count as a block? I believe so. I think as long as it's at least four and that there is, although I guarantee there's another arcane term for what you just said. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but as long as it's sure. not all of the ones that were originally attached together, that would be a sheet. Okay. All right. Sure. Okay. All right. Now, where are we? Um, One other thing about stamps that you have to realize is, you know, you tend to think if you collect things, when you collect things that are not quite right, Mm -hmm. like a slightly off version of what it's supposed to be, that it would be much more expensive and collectible. And in some cases, that's true. Like there, there's a, um, there is somebody in the stamp collecting world uh, that is collecting stuff that nobody else is. Like, there's always going to be somebody out there who wants something. But in the stamp world, you want something as precise and pristine and centered and perfectly done as possible. That that usually tends to be the higher-valued stamp. The other kind that are just kind of off, the, the printing was slightly off-center, that kind of thing, those are called errors, freaks, and oddities, EFOs, in the stamp collecting world. Yeah, those are, it's it's like uh, you're talking about if like there's an Obi Wan Kenobi mm-hmm. figure that mm-hmm. the first thousand that they made he was missing a left ear right uh, in that world that would be the most valuable thing probably ever made exactly <laughs> in the history of the world but yeah like you're saying with stamps they generally they want uh, as far as value goes they want them that are nice and tidy 
Right. But so, I mean, with, with those terms, error free, errors, freaks, and oddities, those are just kind of wildly overstating what they describe. Like, we're talking about a stamp that's just the printing is slightly off center. Right. Or the perforations are just a little bit off or whatever, yeah. maybe kind of half go through there. That would be considered a freak. You know, like, that's how mm-hmm. precise stamp printing is meant to be. So, um, some people do collect that, but for the most part, yeah, you want as, as close to perfect a stamp as possible. That sounds like a record album title. Errors, Freaks, and Oddities? Yeah, like a sure. the best of Guided by Voices or something. <laughs> That's a good one. Or just a, you know, off-brand Discovery Network channel's new show. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, totally. So um, there's cancellations, too. That's another good term to learn if you're getting into stamp collecting. And everybody knows a canceled stamp. It's where they take a like a ink stamp, mm-hmm. stamp over the postage stamp. And it's canceled. You can't reuse it. It's meant to say, this has been used. It's okay. Let it through the mail, but don't try to reuse it again. And that's right. a canceled stamp. But and, it's still you can still collect those stamps. In fact, yeah. you know, most stamps, I think, that people collect have been used and found on these letters, which we'll talk about, that are called covers. But mm-hmm. uh, sometimes that postmark is on the stamp itself, and sometimes it is off to the side, and, you know, because it's not – those uh, people at the post office, they're just stamping those things. They got a lot of work to do. Right. So sometimes you'll just barely get a little bit of cancellation on the stamp, and the rest of the goodness, including the date and where it was mailed from, might be just on the envelope itself. Yeah, and there's a lot of information that can be contained in just a plain old cancellation stamp. Um, some, you know, like some people collect disaster stamps. So, like if you had a a a, a letter that was postmarked or an envelope and a stamp that was postmarked on September 11th, 2001 mm, in New York. Yeah. Somebody's probably collecting, you know, canceled canceled stamps and covers like that. Interesting. I never really thought about that. That makes perfect sense. Also, while we're talking about the people working at the post office, I feel we would be remiss if we did this whole episode without doing a shout-out to our favorite postal worker, Van Nostrand. <laughs> That's right. The great state of Washington. And I don't know where the ads fall, but if there's a stamps.com ad on this, mm-hmm. total total coincidence. That's right. Some people I saw um, collect machined um, stamps, metered postage, too. And like you said, there's probably a subset out there for kind of anything. There definitely is. Every rule you see, there's some rebel group out there breaking <laughs> it in the philately world. Uh, the cover is what I mentioned. Uh, don't you dare call it an envelope. <laughs> yeah. You'd really reveal yourself to be an uh, uh, uneducated rube if you did that. Which there's probably a word for that, too. <laughs> yeah. Like an, a beginning a beginner philatelist is a, a, there's, a there's gum probably liquor. A, <laughs> a gum liquor. <laughs> That's good. Uh, so <laughs> the cover, like I said, is the envelope. Um, sometimes you will keep that whole envelope at least for a little while. Sometimes it's a little, you know, they're easier to hang on to than a tiny stamp sometimes. So you might not want to cut it out right away and you can keep up with those envelopes until you want to get that stamp off. Or like we said, if it's got some of the really valuable information that makes that stamp special is on the cover itself, you may want to keep the whole thing forever and just have it on the envelope. Right. And again, these are things that people pay attention to in the stamp world or collect. And then there's another thing that, that, you know, most of us who just use stamps as like normal human beings um, (laughs) have noticed but don't really pay much attention to are the perforations that we use to separate stamps. Mm -hmm. Like way back in the day, stamps came in sheets and you, colonial person or, you know, um, second industrial age inhabitant, were expected to pull out your scissors and cut the stamps into, you know, little individual singles. Then finally, um, an Irishman named um, Henry Archer from Dublin came up with a perforation tool. And all you're doing is making the the paper at certain points thinner so that it's easily torn at those points. And so the first perforated stamp that came out was the 1850 British Penny Red, which is pretty pretty quickly after stamps were first invented, postal stamps. Um, and with that, uh, Henry Archer created this whole subcategory of stamp, I guess, um, categorization mm-hmm. 
a subcategory of categorization. That is categorical. <laughs> but stamp collecting people, philatelists, um, I'm, I like it the way I say it more, philatelists. No, I should probably say philatelists now that I say it out, <laughs> out loud. Um, so philatelists um, <laughs> yeah. really pay attention to perforations. That's like a really important part of stamp collecting. Yeah, because it can be a big cl- – I mean, it can be a clue as to where it actually came from because these people know how they have perforated things with different machines in different parts of the world in different eras. Mm-hmm. So it can be a very big clue as to the age of the stamp and where it came from. Uh, if they don't have those perforations, they're called imperf- imperforate. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, I talked about the little strips of stamps, the coils. Those obviously are just going to have the perforations on the sides and not the top. Or the top, just not both. Uh, oh, interesting. I've never mm-hmm. really, I guess it depends on which way the art is oriented, right? Exactly, yeah. Uh, and then you've got the the sheets or the pane. And if it's on the outer edges of that sheet or pane, it probably won't have those perforations either. And uh, it is a big deal. You'd be surprised. Yeah, and those outer margins even have their own word, Chuck, selvage, which also applies to, like, you know, the the hem of, like, your shirt or something mm-hmm. that's that's sewn in a certain way to keep it un- from unraveling. That's called selvage, too. But in the stamp collecting world, it's basically the margins, the sheets. Um, and sometimes they have, you know, um, registration marks or dates or, you know, the number of the print run uh, printed in there. Some people collect that, of course, as well. Selvage stamps. I love learning new words. Selvage. I learned one yesterday. Parapet. Mm-hmm. You know what that is? No. I mean, I've seen it before. I just cannot bring to mind what it means. It's like the little, and I learned this because, uh, oh, and I was going to tell you this anyway. I had our buddy Wyatt Sinek mm-hmm. on Movie Crush yesterday. Oh, cool. What did he talk about? Blazing Saddles. <laughs> and there's a scene where, and I've seen Blazing Saddles probably three dozen times. It's mm-hmm. up there with Spinal Tap as far as comedies that I've seen. Okay. And I know it basically by heart. And there's a scene where Mel Brooks as Governor Lepetamine comes into the room and he said, sorry, gentlemen, I was just out walking the parapet. And I never bothered to look up what that meant until yesterday. And it's that little, if you're on top of a building, it's the little half wall. It mm-hmm. goes around the top of a building to keep you from falling off or to make oh, falling off, okay. you know, more interesting. Yeah, right. <laughs> really bangs up the shins <laughs> on your way down. So I never knew that before, walking the parapet. Oh, yeah, okay. So he was saying like he was basically walking on a, the, uh, the edge of a high wall? I guess a low wall, yeah. Low wall high up. With his selvage. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> oh, boy. So um, let's say, Chuck, that you said... I care about perforations. I want to know more about these registration marks on selvage. How do I get into this philately um, as a hobby, Chuck? What would what would you recommend people do to start? Get a bank loan for about collect, fifteen collect grand. No, you. Do, it, it is really one of the cool things about stamp collecting is it's a very low barrier to entry. Uh, you yeah. need to get these little special tongs, these little baby tweezers with rounded tips. And, you know, if you, your skin oils can mar a stamp, mm-hmm. so you want to try and handle them with these little little tweezers so you don't ruin them, that's a good little tool to have. Uh, you're going to want to get an album or a binder, and they make them especially, you know, don't get one for, like, photographs. They make them specially no. for stamps. Right. And sometimes they have little pockets that you can slip them in that are adorable. And sometimes they have hinges, uh, which are little strips of paper with a little bit of gum on them. To put the stamps on, you might want a magnifying glass or a jeweler's sure. loop, but uh, you don't need a microscope or anything. I think a, about a 10x is probably the most kind of magnification you'll need. Yes. Um, eventually, too, you're going to find that you have perforation fever. Yes. And you're going to get yourself a perf gauge. <laughs> oh, boy. Which is basically a specialized transparent ruler that sh- that you line up the lines to the perforation marks and uh, the gauge of a perforation is how many perforation holes there are per two centimeters. So cool. 
And this is important because, you know, some stamps are exactly the same as other stamps. The only difference is, is like they were printed on, they were perforated with slightly different machines or something mm-hmm. like that. Or, you know, like the stamp collecting community knows when a perforating machine's pin breaks. They know about that machine and its right. pin. So they can tell you where that thing was printed and when and what run it was out of how many just because there's a a what's called a blind perforation where the hole wasn't punched through where it should have been. Yeah. Uh, in the one position on this one stamp. Like that's I love how it. intensely known stamps are by yeah. the fillet, philately community. It's it's really cool. I think uh that's one thing I like about it is how myopic it can get mm-hmm. and how specific it can get. It's just, you know, it's it's time well spent and I bet it's very calming. Yes. Yeah, just just researching it is calming, you know. I, I fell asleep a few times. Stuff like, <laughs> stuff like that really comes through. When you're researching something and you find you're relaxed, uh-huh. the thing you're doing would be even more relaxing, yes, I think. Yes, totally. You know? Like making flies or painting like duck decoys. Yeah, like that, yeah. You know? I love that. Or or painting stamps like uh, in Fargo. Mm-hmm. Mar- Mar- Margie's stamp. husband. I love it. Yeah. It's just the two cent. Norm. <laughs> Norm was great. I love yeah, it. Yeah, he was great. Uh, so you might want a internet connection. Um, <laughs> you will probably want to get a stamp catalog, and we'll talk about the sort of the big books that are out there uh, in a bit. But all of this stuff is basically online now. Uh, but you also might like having a book. If you're into stamps, I bet you dollars to donuts, you might rather hold a book in your hand. Every time you say that, you said that on Tuesday, too, in one of the episodes. Did I? And yeah, every time you say that, I think of this one Simpsons where Homer goes, deal, and puts his dollar down. <laughs> it's weird because I don't really say that expression much, but I've said it twice in a week. Yeah, hmm. you definitely did because I thought about it the other day, too. I also did my that dumb uh, What We Do in the Shadows guy in like two episodes in a row. Yeah, and another point, too, it's so funny because I think it's a mild transgression when we kind of cop one another's words. Uh Uh-huh. You used droll. Um, I did. I can't remember what episode, but you said droll, and then I used it recently, too, (laughs) after that. And as I was saying it, I was like, Chuck, that's that's a word. Chuck word, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just use it. Is it okay if I use that word? So It's fine. I'll lend you droll. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate that. Uh, you might want Watermark Detector Fluid. Actually, that's a pretty good album name, too. Sure. Um, sometimes stamps will have an anti-counterfeiting measure put in place yeah. uh, with a watermark. And sometimes you can hold up a stamp to the light and see the watermark. And sometimes you will need to dive a bit deeper and put that watermark detector fluid on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not that much money, but it's not necessarily the first thing you need in your kit as a as a beginning gum licker. Right. I mean, you're you're gonna basically just be be <laughs> looking at. Well, that's a neat picture. I like mm-hmm. that picture. Like that's that's a cool stamp. And then eventually you'll be like, what's on the back? What's the secret hidden message that I'm missing on this? That's right. I, I also saw there's machines that you can get for about two hundred and fifty dollars that are whoa. basically like those you know those old timey projector things that they they use in class, like an overhead projector. Yes. Yeah. But this is a this is one that projects into some sort of magnifier that you lean over and look into. Um, there's like a light bulb, and you don't have to use any fluid. It doesn't have any impact on your stamp whatsoever. It's just just shows you the watermark. It's pretty neat. All right, I'm in. That's for the well healed philatelists, though. I'm out. <laughs> so there's another thing you need that's really really important. It's a basic part of stamp collecting. And that is stamps. That's right. And if you're just getting started, uh, one thing you can do is go online and you can buy just a a lot or a collection of stamps, uh, sort of a grab bag that you have no idea what's in there. And that can be a really fun way to get started because, like I mentioned earlier, that's where you might poke through and get inspired and say, you know what, it turns out I really like this particular kind of stamp or two. And I think that might be what my focus should be. And that's a mm-hmm. good way to find that out. Yeah. I mean, getting a grab bag of anything is a good way to really find out who you who you really are. Yeah, agreed. <laughs> you know? <laughs> sure. So, and that is something you can do. You can order it online. If you live in a big enough city, there's probably a stamp 
collecting store. Yeah. Um, you can also, like, I read this pamphlet by, I think, the American Philately Association or Society, APS, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, they wrote the pamphlet. Um, and they, uh, yeah, philatelic. Philatelic. <laughs> Damn that word. Okay, philatelic. I think I got it right. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, the American Philatelic is so, so, so <laughs> man, the oh, APS boy. had a pamphlet, and they basically said, if you're a little kid and you don't have any money because your parents don't give you an allowance or anything, you could still get into stamp collecting. And they, they give all these ideas of how to get free stamps. To Stealing start. mail. <laughs> Go to, like, offices and be uh-huh. like, hey, you got any mail? You guys get a lot of mail. You got any envelopes you don't want anymore? Or um, yeah. start, find a pen pal in another country because they'll have stamps that are a dime a dozen to them, but to you it's a foreign stamp, and you can just start sending each other letters with, you know, cool stamps. Yeah. Or even stamps inside the envelope. Who knows? Um, There's a lot of ways to get into stamp collecting basically for free or for the cost maybe of a stamp. Um, that, that, which is again one of the one of the reasons why stamp collecting is just so accessible. It, it costs no, next to nothing to to get into to get started with. And even when you really get into it, it's not an expensive hobby. No, and if you know if you get a bunch of stamps or you get a bunch of covers with stamps, and you're just beginning your uh, your journey, um, you want, you're going to get them all, lay them out in a room, look at them, decide what you like, mm-hmm. and you don't want to just remove all the, I mean you can do whatever you want but uh I, I would advise that you decide what you want to um separate from the cover mm-hmm. because there is a process involved that we're going to go over now and it's not the hardest thing in the world but you don't want to do that to 20 or 30 stamps that you're like no nah, I actually don't like these after all it's a waste of time who wants Yeah I mean it's like that time. next level of preservation um and once you have picked those out what you do is you get a bowl with warm water, warm mm-hmm. tap water. Mm-hmm. Stick you your wanna... finger in until sure. you lose control of your bladder. <laughs> and then you start the stamp sorting process. That's right. You go pee pee just a little bit. And then you float that stamp. If you have cut it away from the cover, if you decided to do that, leave yourself a few centimeters around the stamp. You know, don't get too close. Yeah, but you make a good point. You, you want to go through everything first and be like, are there any cool... Um, you know, cancellations on here. Uh, is this envelope just neat? Yeah. You, you, you don't necessarily want to separate all stamps from envelopes. Or, or any covers. rad perfs. Exactly. So <laughs> you, you want to make that decision first. And then once you decide that you want just the stamp, then you start cutting out and leave a little envelope around it. Right. So you float that little bad boy in some warm tap water. Stamp uh, up, right? Yeah, you got to float it stamp up. And you can do a few at a time, but I wouldn't get too crazy if you're just a, a little gum liquor. <laughs> and I would weigh it into those warm waters. And <laughs> if it's from a Christmas envelope or something, if it's like a red envelope. Beware. Yes, beware, because that can very much discolor your stamp. Uh, hopefully, it's just like a good old-fashioned white envelope. Uh, wait about 10 or 15 minutes, and that stamp will start to, that gum will just sort of dissolve away. And that stamp will kind of separate and then float off on its own, get those tongs, those little tweezers out. Mm -hmm. Uh, You don't want to just grab it with your grimy old human fingers and just kind of pat it dry, and you've got yourself a stamp. Yeah, you want to be really careful, though, because a wet stamp is unsurprisingly very fragile. Yeah. A lot of people put um, their, their wet stamps on paper towels. You want to make sure you've gotten all the gum off first, though. Um, and then they put those paper towels in a heavy book and then let the let it dry like that. That's, I mean, what we just described is philatelic um, state of the art, basically. <laughs> That's right. So you want to take another break and then come back and talk a little stamp history, famous stamps, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I, I love this part. Let's do that. Okay. So you mentioned stamp history. Uh, 
they've been collecting stamps since the first stamp, which is kind of cool. I don't know why someone said, you know, I want to hang on to this, but someone did. And uh, after May 1st, 1840, Great Britain issued the Penny Black, Mm -hmm. the very first postage stamp. Uh, It was supposed to roll out on May 6th as far as being used, but they sent them out a little bit early to post offices. So they were ready to go on May 6th Mm -hmm. and some post offices said, eh, let's just go ahead and kind of get the ball rolling because I have a feeling we're going to be behind really quickly. And so some of those little penny blacks are dated earlier than May 6th, and those will be worth a little bit more money. Uh, but they are not – like there were a bunch of penny blacks, so it's not like the Honus Wagner baseball card. Right. It's not like the penny black is the most valuable stamp ever made. It's a little counterintuitive, but – rarity for any collection is what makes it valuable, and they're just not as rare as you might think. Right. But that's a good example of that cancellation that people um, will will collect. Yeah. Because you want a, a canceled penny black that predates that May 6th, 1840 date because it's just unusual and, and rare. Totally. That's also, I think, May 1st. So May 1st was the the date where they started issuing them, even though that was five days early. So that would be what's called a first day cover. It's an envelope with a stamp that's canceled on the first day of issue. And sometimes there's even a special stamp that they'll use, say, first day issue. People collect covers like that, too. They even have, like, ceremonies for these kind of things. Especially, I swear to God, if they're releasing a commemorative stamp in particular, there's definitive stamps, which are your everyday, you know, American flag forever stamp. Um, that they, they basically release in unlimited quantities. Then there's commemorative stamps. They usually have a more limited run. They're available for a limited time. They often commemorate a person, an event, something like that. Um, and when they release those stamps, they'll have like a ceremony um, at, at a specific post office in a specific city with dignitaries and famous people there sometimes. They'll print programs and everything. And if you're a stamp collector, you want to be at that first day ceremony or at the very least, you're collecting those kind of covers, too, if that's the kind of thing you're into. Yeah, I think it's kind of awesome that when you go to the post office still and you go and ask for a book of stamps, mm-hmm. if you have no interest at all in stamp collecting, they will present you usually with a few things that go, what kind of stamps you want? <laughs> and, do you have? And anecdotally, I can say that most people choose something rather than saying, I don't care. I just want something to mail something. <laughs> Stop I've been asking me questions. <laughs> I've been plenty of post offices, and most people go, oh, those dogs look nice. I'll take those. Yeah, dogs playing poker are even better. It's cute. I love it. I, I pick out my stamps. I don't spend a lot of time on it, but if they present me with a few, I'll uh, I'll kind of give them a quick once over and say, mm-hmm. well, I'd like to mail. That represents me a little bit, and that's kind of what it is. Give me those Mr. Rogers stamps. Oh, are there some? I'm sure there is. Yeah, I'll bring you one. I'll Shut mail up. you something with one on it. How about that? <laughs> do you that? really have some? Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. Send me something for sure. I will. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned the first day cover, though. They uh, People will collect first day covers of just very regular, commonly issued stamps just because it's a first day cover. Right. Because you never know. That thing might be worth something one day. Right. But that's what I'm saying. That's what they have those ceremonies for, too, sometimes. Yeah. And then if you have, like, a something that's designed or a design that's printed on a stamp, it's called a cachet. Yet another arcane jargon term. Um, and America, people spend a lot of time, by the way. I looked up into the cachet world. Uh-huh. And there are uh, stamp collectors that very much get into making their own cachets mm-hmm. and uh, special made cachets. And it's a whole other subset as well. Yeah, it's basically, you know, if, you, if you've ever seen an envelope with a stamp of uh, an angel blowing a trumpet around Christmas time or something like that, that's cachet. Well, I mean, a cachet is an additional, like, ink stamp put on right. the envelope. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, uh, okay. Like a, a stamp. St- yeah, I know. There, we need another term. I for think that. that's what confused rubber, me. <laughs> rubber ink stamp. A rubber yeah. ink stamp of an angel blowing a horn around Christmas time. Uh, I gotcha. I gotcha. So um, America got into the Stamp Releasing Act about less than a decade after Great Britain did. And Great Britain, by the way, being the first nation on the planet to issue postage stamps, didn't bother to put the nation of origin. If you look at every other stamp ever issued, 
uh, by a government authority. It has the, the nation on it somewhere. There's some signifier that this came from America or Zimbabwe or something like that. Um, Great Britain still to this day doesn't because they were the first, and so they still don't, don't put Great Britain or UK or anything on their stamps. That's right. It's pretty cool. Yep. So America got into it in 1847, July 1st, no less. There was a five cent Benjamin Franklin, a 10 cent George Washington. And what else did we need, you know? Yeah. And this is not, you know, we, it can get confusing when you think of like the Stamp Act and, you know, stamping tea and things like that. Those were different kinds of stamps. We used to stamp tax bills and permits and any kind of government sort of thing, uh, exchange might be stamped. That is a revenue stamp, mm-hmm. and you it's sort of just a, a different world. Like, if you collect postage stamps, you might also collect revenue stamps, but they're, you keep them separate. You don't put them together. <laughs> you, you don't tell your friends who collect postage stamps that you're collecting revenue or fiscal stamps. That's your yeah. dirty secret. Postage stamps are kind of where the bread and butter is for sure. stamp collecting, I think. So, like we said um, before, the kind of like one of the recognized authorities on stamp collecting and stamps in general is the Scott Catalog, which has been produced from a company in Ohio since 1868. And they basically just started tracking stamp after stamp. So, the lower the number associated with the stamp that the Scott Catalog is given that stamp, the earlier the stamp was released. And so over time, it's grown into, I think, a 12-volume collection catalog, the Scott catalog has. But it's so widely known and widely used that a lot of stamps are 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 described and and talked about by their Scott catalog number rather than, you know, whatever common name they have. Right. And there are prefixes and suffixes uh, if there are different special issued stamps or some of those errors you were talking about or some rad purse, Mm -hmm. Um, the inverted Jenny, which we'll talk about in a minute, like that's known as C3A in the stamp world. Mm -hmm. The C Uh, denotes airmail stamps. Yeah, which is great and a little counterintuitive. (laughs) A little bit, sure. It would be an A in my world. You would think so, but I think A is for awesome. The most awesome stamps (laughs) is what the A is reserved for. Uh, There's also the Michelle catalog from Germany, and that is around to fill in the gaps that the Scott Guide does not cover because the Scott Guide is American. And they're like, we don't want Cuban stamps in our book. Can you believe it? Yeah, it's weird. If there were nations that are embargoed or whatever, uh, sometimes they will not be. I think North Korean stamps, too, are not in the Scott uh, catalog. So the Michelle catalog comes around because they're German and they're like, sure, we'll cover it. It's fine. Sure. Um, so it turns out that there's actually been a pretty decent amount of famous people who collect stamps. Um, just because there's so many people who collect stamps, some of them are bound to be famous, right? John Lennon. Yeah, I read about his stamp collecting. He seems to have inherited his cousin Stanley's stamp collection, basically changed the name on the cover of the album to his name, (laughs) and then, you know, added a few more stamps. He doesn't seem to have been a passionate philatelist by any stretch from what I've seen. All right. Um, Ayn Rand was. (laughs) I know. Uh, And then uh, Patrick Dempsey, I saw referenced here or there. McDreamy? Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> and then Queen Elizabeth II apparently is a stamp collector. Okay. Um, and then Sally Ride was a very famous philatelist as well and ended up on a stamp herself. Yes, sadly. Um, this is something that I think is super cool. The fact no, that no, Emil- Sally Ride was fine. She didn't die in an accident. Oh, she that's died right. later was, in life. Yeah, that yeah. was Krista McAuliffe. That's who I was thinking of. Did you ever see that Challenger documentary yet? I still haven't. It's in my queue. Oh, man, it is just astounding. I, you can't believe it. I can't believe the interviews that they got and what they got the people to finally admit to. It's crazy. Amazing. Uh, Amelia Earhart, I think this is super cool. She actually funded some of her aviation expeditions. Uh, including some of those transatlantic flights with stamps. Uh, mm-hmm. She would get covers, and she would – sometimes they were cash, uh, cached, mm-hmm. and she would get stamps, and she would fly to places and get them postmarked, and it would be obviously super valuable. She might even sign it sometimes yeah. and sell them. And this would be like, boy, this is a, a cover and a stamp 
from Amelia Earhart's flight across the ocean Mm -hmm. uh, stamped here and in like England or something Mm -hmm. or stamped in England or uh, canceled, I guess, in England. Right. And uh, when she went down in that plane, there were five with along with poor Fred Noonan. Poor Fred. There were 5,000 covers that she had pre-sold to fund that flight that were stamped and postmarked for her stops around the world. Mm -hmm. Very cool fact. That brought to mind the mail on the Titanic. Remember we were making fun of people dropping off their mail? Apparently Mm -hmm. there was a lot of mail on the Titanic, and I didn't think about it, but it wasn't just people dropping off their mail, passengers on the Titanic mailing postcards. RMS stands for Royal Mail Ship. So the RMS Titanic was a mail carrier too. So it was carrying British and Irish and European mail over to America as well. And from what I could tell, none of it survived. There's a surviving letter that was not mailed. It was written on Titanic letterhead, but it was kept in somebody's belongings. But I I guess all of the mail uh, workers on the Titanic died basically trying to save the mail, but they were unable to, and it's still down there. But they think it's possible some of it's still preserved, and they might bring it up someday. Uh, President Roosevelt was a a very— dedicated stamp collector, FDR, uh, pre-presidency and then through his presidency, which was many, many years. Mm -hmm. And this is interesting in that the president has the ear of the postmaster general. I know, it seems unfair. Uh, Well, I mean, I think it's kind of cool, though. Like, he got into it, and he wasn't just like, "Uh, yeah, just print a bunch of stamps, it's fine, like every other president. Mm -hmm. Um, In the 1930s, he got together with General James A. Farley of uh, the postmaster general and said, you know, let's help. I want to help design these things and let's brainstorm <laughs> colors and themes and designs. And what he if he sketched was terrib- out design? <laughs> what? what if he was terrible at it? <laughs> and Farley would see him come in, just He's roll like, his okay. eyes, like, oh, here comes another bad idea from FDR. All Lock of his stick figures had like gigantic hands and stuff. <laughs> but he was the president, so Farley had to release those stupid stamps. That's pretty funny. Uh, <laughs> But it's kind of cool, though. He did sketch out ideas, apparently. And in his collection, he had some full sheets and he had some dye proofs and stuff like that. So he did he did have a, a an advantage for sure. Yeah, apparently they used to release a lot of pictures of him collecting stamps as, as part of like calm reassurance to the nation that there was like a, a steady hand, um, literally and figuratively, in, yeah. in leading the country, which is kind of cool. Can we talk about the inverted Jenny, the coolest stamp Finally. of all time? Yeah, there's a bunch of famous stamps. We should say the inverted Jenny is not the most the the mo, the high the most valuable stamp that goes to the um, the British Guiana magenta, right? Yeah, which it isn't that great looking, but it's just rare, I guess. It, I think there's only one of it in in. Um, in existence, the British Guiana one cent magenta, but the the far and away the inverted Jenny is the the most famous stamp of all time has to be. Yeah. So in 1918, uh, the U.S. commissioned a stamp to commemorate the first airmail uh, service going on, and so they decided on a two color stamp with a plane on it, mm-hmm. a Curtis JN four. Mm-hmm. And when you do something with two colors, you print the first thing. In this case, it was the red frame around the plane. And then the second thing that they would print would be the blue plane itself. And there was an error at one point, and there were a few panes where it was flipped upside down. And it was either the sheet or the printing plate was upside down. And so the the Jenny uh, was inverted. Mm -hmm. And you've got this upside down plane. And all of a sudden, stamp collectors get wind of this. And they're like, oh my gosh, there was a mistake. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We need to get our hands on some of these. Yeah, this guy named William Roby showed up at the printing press and said, do you have any that are messed up, that are upside down? And they had found that they had printed some accidentally, uh, and all but one sheet was destroyed. So 100 inverted jennies were produced, which makes it not one of the rare stamps around. Remember that that British Kiana once at Magenta, there's only one. There's right. only one Benjamin Franklin Z grill. There's 100 of these things. But... Um, People just love them. They go bonkers for them. Uh, And as a matter of fact, one of the reasons why the inverted Jenny has become such a a sought-after part of the stamp collecting world is because it's it's just been in the spotlight so much. Like, there have been some really high-profile thefts Mm -hmm. of inverted Jennies over the years. There was one block of four called the McCoy block that was stolen in 1955, and every 
couple decades, one of them's recovered, and there's a big to-do about it. Um, there was another theft from the New York Public Library in 1977 that was finally recovered years later. Um, it's just something about that stamp makes it the most, the most famous of all time. That's right. And in this one case, there was a dealer, uh, or there was this man who purchased the sheet, sold it to a dealer. Mm-hmm. Dealer sells it to this wealthy businessman. And the dealer had penciled in numbers on the back of these stamps Mm -hmm. individually so you could identify the stamps, uh, which, of course, it it was not in mint condition, but they were at least identifiable. And I think the story goes that one of these was stolen, and it turned up in the 80s with the perforations cut off, Mm -hmm. and the number on the back was changed to a 9, which wasn't a stamp that had ever been circulated. So they knew that it was the stolen stamp. Right, but they they thought that it could have been this nine that had never been circulated that had made its way into circulation. But it wasn't until 2002 when a woman's locket, the wife of um, Colonel Edward Green, the guy who bought that original uh, block of 100, that businessman, um, she died and her locket made its way into auction. And somebody opened it up and found that the inverted Jenny in the number nine position was actually in the locket. So the other one was found to be a fraud that way, which is just, you can't write this stuff, you know? I think you meant Colonel Mustard. It's Mr. Green. <laughs> I know. I thought the same thing. <laughs> Professor Plum. Pretty cool story, though. Uh, yeah. I think the last one... In 2019, sold for 1.35 mil. So yeah, there was a block not, of them. I think not the most valuable, but pretty pretty pricey. Plus, also, it made its way into one of the better movies that came out of the 80s, Brewster's Millions. Remember? Uh, oh, sure. Was that in there? Yeah, he burned up like a bunch of money by mailing a postcard using the inverted Jenny as mail. <laughs> oh, that's a fun fact. Yeah, yeah, pretty cool, huh? I love it. And that ties in with Blazing Saddles because Richard Pryor almost played Sheriff Bart. Oh, nice. Full what circle. is the name of the actor who did instead? Uh, Cleavon Little, who was great. That's right. But yeah. Richard Pryor was a, a writer on the movie. Okay. Uh, you got anything else about Richard Pryor or Philately? Nope. Neither do I. But there is a ton out there. Like, I read an article about how the serial number that's written on the side of the plane on the inverted Jenny and how philatelists got to the bottom of why that serial number was used. Like, I mean, there is a lot of information out there and there's a lot of stamps to collect. So go forth and try out a new hobby and see what you think. And since I said go forth, that means, of course, it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this heartfelt thanks. Uh, hey, guys, as we mark the one year anniversary of the COVID lockdown, I'm compelled to write and thank you for what you've done, what you do, and hopefully what you will continue to do. Sure. Yours was my first podcast subscription from several years back. And as a stay at home mom that has uh, that list has grown substantially across several genres and I'm plugged in constantly when I clean, cook, exercise, etc. Uh, when lockdown was first initiated here in California, I tried to keep as normal a schedule as possible despite all three of my children relegated to home for distance learning. Uh, None of my at least dozen podcasts seemed appropriate to absorb except for yours. The funny ones seemed too trivial, the crime ones too gruesome, the history ones too dry, and none could keep my attention. Again, except for yours. Your show is such the perfect balance between knowledge, lightheartedness, sincerity, and understanding, and the true friendship radiates from your voices, uh, and it's incredibly soothing. I revisited your past episodes for 10 months before I was able to keep listening to anything else. I'm sure I'm not alone when I say I don't know how I would have gotten through this past year without you two filtering out all the negative vibes in my head. You two are the uh, bestest friends I've never met. Keep on keeping on. And that is uh, Zenaida Johnson of San Jose, California. Man, that was a bang up email, Zenaida. Thank you very much for that. It is. And Believe it or not, we need to hear that stuff, too. So I, we really <laughs> yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, well, I'll never get tired of hearing that. But it's, all, you know, it's just we talk about a pat on the back, you know, being hearing that we help people get through the pandemic is that's about as high praise as you can get these days. Means a lot. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Zenaida. Um, and uh, we're glad that we could help you out and everybody who we helped out. And everybody who we slightly annoyed or made laugh or did anything over the last year or 13 years. Thank you for listening. How about that? If you want to get, said. thank you. If you want to get in touch with us, like Zenaida, is it Zenaida or Zenaida? 
Zenaida. She even uh, was kind enough to put a little pronunciation guide. Very nice. If you want to get in touch with us like Zenaida did, then you can send us an email to stuff. Oh, wait. Don't forget to lick a stamp and slap it on the bottom with that stamp and then send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.